So when you worship in a place that says thank you for all that you've done, it changes things. When you realize the thing that you're begging him for was already done. And you're only begging him because you didn't know that what you're asking for is in your hand. When the Lord delivers you from being a beggar, your worship changes. When the Lord delivers you from yourself, worship changes. Because a lot of our worship is anchored down to ourself. And we can't worship him without thinking about our circumstance because we're naturally selfish people. But when we forget about who we are and we forget about where we are and we forget about our circumstance and what didn't work and what did happen. And we say, God, I'm just here because I'm created to worship you. Everything changes. Who cares how much money you have or don't have? Who cares who did you wrong or who did you right? Who cares what happened three years ago? Can you lay it down in the presence of God? Because he is in the room. And whenever he's in the room, he solves problems. I don't have to worry as long as he's here. Listen, Jesus showed up for people who weren't just desperate to be healed. He showed up for people who were desperate for him. People knew that the healing was in him. So in order to get to the healing, they had to get to him. People knew that the deliverance was in him. So in order to get deliverance, they had to get to him. Because everything that you need is in him. If you can get to him, you can have everything. But here's the thing. Getting to him is right now right now it's a simultaneous thing of you realizing that he's here right now how many of you are saved in here that means that you abide in him and he abides in you how many of you in here are saved and don't feel like you're saved sometimes and if you knew how holy he was everybody would lift their hands so that means that you will always be a worshiping mess. You know why that's a revelation? That's a revelation because you thought you had to not be a mess to be a worshiper. But real worship is knowing I can worship and be a mess and I'm thankful for his mercy because the more messed up I am, the more I worship you when I really know who you are. But when I'm bound by religion, I got to get free before he can hear me. But when I know that I'm a son, I worship him when I'm full of dirt. And he'll cover me with a robe, put a ring on my finger, and put shoes on my feet. And say, let's throw a party because my son is in the room. My daughter is in the room. Shake the religion and the shame off of you. And step into knowing he loves you. Come on, tell your neighbor he loves you. He loves you. He loves you. Listen, when you know that, his wor your worship will change. Because you can be thankful again. You can be thankful again. Thankful again. How many of you in here are thankful? How many of you have been saved and set free? and delivered in Jesus name listen needing deliverance needing deliverance is only a bad thing if you don't know the deliverer if you know the deliverer you have to learn how to worship in your chains hear me there is something that happens when you know, I'm struggling with something right now, but I know that he is a deliverer. I'm struggling with something right now, but I know that he is a restorer. I'm struggling right now, but I know that his mercy endures forever. I'm struggling right now. I don't have to feel it. 
to know that he is in the room and because he's in the room I'm going to worship him I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to worship him anyway come hell or high water I'm going to worship him stop allowing your struggles to keep you from the room stop allowing your struggles to keep you from the room that's why you're still struggling because you won't accept what's already in the room because you keep trying to work for something that was already paid off when you get this your worship will change you can lay at the altar with the struggle you can cry with the struggle I've learned that when I mess up, I don't beat myself up over it. I say, Lord, I thank you that I can mess up. I thank you that I can mess up. Because the only reason you won't thank God that you messed up is if you don't believe he's going to forgive you. The only reason that you would feel the way that you feel about messing up is because you didn't know that he is a God full of mercy. And so what you need to do is you need to drop your stones. Because you have been stoning yourself for far too long. The Lord said, daughter, son, look up. Where are your accusers? There are none. And neither do I accuse you. And neither do I accuse you. Some of you in here have heavy struggles. I can see it on your face. And you know what? I smile because it's on all of our faces. You know why? Because we've all fallen short of the glory of God. He said, oh, wretched man that I am. The things that I want to do, I don't do. And the things I don't want to do, I find myself doing. Who's going to deliver me from this body of death? And you know what Paul said next? He thanked God because he knew on the other end of his mess was mercy. Come on. At least I know I can be thankful to be a mess as long as I know that there's mercy. you got to learn it because when you learn it, your worship will change. Some of you, the reason why we struggle is because our teacher is not mercy. Our teacher is what you learned and that religion taught you in church. Who would have ever told you it's okay to be a mess? Because you know what? Sometimes... You can't get unmessy from that thing until you grow up. And some of you just ain't grown yet. Stop holding yourself to a standard God didn't bring you to yet. You're still crawling around in diapers and beating yourself up for peeing in your diaper. You're not there yet. Stop beating your stop beating the infancy of your life. Stop abusing the infancy of your life. You're not ready to sit at the table without being buckled in yet. That's not the season you're in. You're not ready to get your driver's license yet. Why are you beating yourself up? Because you still have to ask for a ride. You're not there yet. Stop trying to be in a place God never called you to and being the God of your life, carrying the standard that you created and beating yourself over something that God isn't even concerned about. There's some things you're worried about God's not concerned. Because you know what he said? I got you. You know why? Because before you were even framed in your mother's womb, I was doing this. You weren't even a thought yet. Adam wasn't even here yet. I'm working on chapter 6. And you mad about chapter 9 and it ain't even happened yet. The key here is he wrote your book and at the end of every book of your life is and they live happily ever after. And so if you accept Christ daily, you'll know what that last page says. So when I lose my job, all I got to think about is that last page. So when I feel like I'm a mess, all I got to think about is that last page. When I feel like I can't take another step, all I got to think about is that last page. When I feel suicidal and depressed and I feel shame and guilt, all I can think about is that last page. Because you know when that last page was put in there was when Jesus stretched his arms on the cross and said, it is finished. You didn't have that page before that. It was just a book. But he finished your book when he said it was finished. 
Come on, go like this with your shoulders. And just tell yourself, relax. Relax. I, I, I'm not doing religion no more. I'm not doing this religious stuff no more. I need to learn how to be messy. Because you won't ever not be messy until you see him eye to eye. The enemy will try to get you to focus on your mess so you can't see him. You thought focusing on your mess was going to get you to him. What you didn't know was that your focus on your mess will keep you from him. Because you focusing on your mess is pride. You forgot the mess that you're focusing on was still on the tree. The mess is not on you. It's on the tree. The depression is not on you. It's on the tree. The sickness is not on you. It's on the tree. The disease is not on you. It's on the tree. The pornography is not on you. It's on the tree. The guilt is not on you. It's on the tree. So what are you talking about? What shame? What sickness? What disease? What depression? What illness? It's, it's on the tree. The question is, I know you believe he resurrected, but you haven't got the, re the, the revelation that he died. Because if you only believe he lived, but you don't believe he died, then you have a reason to stay in your mess. Because if he didn't die, then the thing that you're focusing on would still be living. He had to die so the thing that you're frustrated about yourself with could die with him. Well, I know we want to have a resurrection and we want to believe in power and we want to see people rise up. But you have to understand that the very thing that you are struggling with and frustrated about, if you believe he died, died with him. So this is the question. If you really believe that Jesus died and all sin died with him, what are you struggling with? Why is it still living in your house? If it died on the cross. Come on, turn to your neighbor and say this. Why is it in the crib? If it was supposed to be on the cross. Now I'm not talking about the baby crib. I'm talking about the crib. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Turn to your other neighbor and say, why is it at the crib? If it's supposed to be on the cross. Somebody say, I'm delivered. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Hear me. I'm not saying that your struggle is not real. What I'm saying is, that if you would get the real revelation of his death and resurrection, your struggle would begin to start disappearing. Because believe it or not, our struggle grows at the level of disbelief. Your struggle grows not because you keep doing your struggle more. It grows because of disbelief. Because it takes faith to be holy. But it takes disbelief to be unholy. So you don't have a behavior problem. You have a belief problem. You know that he died. But you don't know that he died. Because if you knew that he died. Everything that you've been focusing on. Would be dead with him. Amen. Somebody shout it's dead. Listen you don't have to go back home to it. You got to talk to it. You got to talk to it. Uh, I, I was talking to uh, my barber today. He said, he said, I, he came up with a name. He came up with a name for his flesh. He, he, the name, he, he named his flesh Stupid Head. <laughs> he said, Stupid Head. And, and the reason why he said it helped me separate myself from the conversation. 
it helped me separate myself from those things. It helped me separate myself from what I hear. And when you realize that what you hear is not you, then you could fight better. You'll stop fighting yourself. Because you, cause now you can fight stupid head. Come on, turn to your neighbor and say, I'm not stupid head. Stop fighting yourself. Stop fighting yourself. It's a battle you'll never win. It's a battle you'll never win. If we could really see the pictures, we ought to come up with some illustrations or something so somebody, so we can actually see what it looks like for us to fight ourselves. Can you see the picture? Can you imagine you're just in your room, just swinging on yourself? Just swinging on. I mean, how much of a fool would you look fighting your own self? <laughs> and somebody opens the door and you're swinging at you. <laughs> Black eye, bloody lip. What you doing? I'll just beat myself up. That's what we do in the spirit to ourselves all the time. It looks foolish, but that's what we do. So don't beat yourself up anymore. Just be thankful. Be thankful that you can be a mess and find mercy. Amen. Amen. Let's transition so we can get into the word. If our ushers would come and wait on us as we prepare to give, if you would give your, get your offering and prepare it before the Lord. How many of you love to give? I can hear this side. This side's a little bit weak over here. How many of you love to give? Uh, how many of you love to receive? Yeah. Amen. Hmm. Jesus. Thank you. We have a few ways that we can give, give here if you look on the screen. Uh, you can use Cash App at uh, money sign Kairos Global or you can text the word give to 833-221-6377 and we are in the process of looking for a new building uh, we looked at a building the other day that was beautiful and it is 2.5 million dollars so how many of you know that God is greater than 2.5 million dollars and in heaven there are streets of gold and pillars of pearl. So if you have $2.5 million and you'd like to bless us, you can't do it through Cash App. Uh, <laughs> that ain't going to work. <laughs> no, but be praying with us um, for what, what's next. If you need an envelope, if you would lift up your hands. And our ushers will bring you an envelope if you have cash or a check. You can write a check out to Kairos Global Network. you know the Lord is good. Amen. Amen. Before we pray, if you, have a, if you have an envelope and you're done with it, just raise up your hand and our ushers will come to you. Um, and while you're doing that, if you would just lift your gift up to the, to the sky, up to the Lord. I talk about it all the time. Whenever the Lord had something, he would, he would raise it up and he would, he would break the bread and he would give God thanks. And we found out in a message a few months ago that it means to summons a blessing. And so right now, I just want you to thank God out of your own mouth. Be begin to thank God for what's in your hand. 
Thank him for what's in your hand. And thank him for the more, the more that we don't deserve, but he chooses to give us because he's a good father. Father, I thank you, Lord, for every person under the sound of my voice, Father. I pray, Lord God, that you would just bless them, that you would fill up their cup, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Not just halfway, not just the brim, but we serve a God who knows how to do a running over work. Father, I pray that you would run over. Father, that you would bring great blessings to them, great promotion to them, that you would see them and hear them. Father, we love you, we thank you, and we praise you for everything you've done for us in Jesus' name. And everybody shouted, amen, amen. God is good. Um, man, that whole what God did, God's not done doing. We got to learn how to carry what he did because he's always doing it, right? His word is living. I want you to turn your Bible to John chapter 5. We're going to be in John chapter 5, 1 through verse 15 for the remainder of this message. And I have... 25 minutes to get this message to you. I don't know what God is going to do. I don't know what God is going to do, but I do believe that he wants to wake something up in you. And as I'm here now, I feel like the reason why the beginning part of the service happened the way that it happened is because God needs you to know that, that a lot of the reasons why you're not as far as you could be is because you keep focusing on your mess. And a lot of the reason why you're not as called as you think you are is because you keep focusing on your mess. How many of you know that you saying yes to the call doesn't mean that you have to be perfect? How many of you know that? How many of you know that you can say yes and still be a mess? There's not a person in the Bible who didn't say yes and wasn't a mess. How is it that David, as messed up as David was, was still a man after his own heart? Because you can't let your mess stop you from chasing him. You got to learn how to chase God and be messy. Does that make sense? Is this kind of messing with your head? Because I know it can mess with your head sometimes because it's like, wait a minute, I thought I had to get clean first. No, no, he's cleaning you, and he's forever cleaning you. The sanctification process is every day. Amen? You won't get there till you get there. Amen? John chapter 5, verse 1. I'm going to read straight through. When you're there, say amen. Amen. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. Somebody say moving. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he already had been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do do you want to be made well? Seems like a rhetorical question, and it was. But the sick man answered him and said, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool, into the water when it's stirred up. But while I'm coming in, another one steps down before me. And Jesus said to him, Rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately, and immediately, and immediately, the man was made well, took up his bed, and he walked. And that day was the Sabbath, and the Jews therefore said to him, Who was cured? It is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. He answered them, He who made me well said to me, Take up your bed and walk. Then they asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed did not know who it was. For Jesus had withdrawn 
a multitude being in that place. Isn't that amazing? You read the Bible and you find that Jesus would oftentimes leave when the crowd got big. He was not after a following. He was after his father. Afterward, Jesus, that's a word right there. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. I feel this in my belly. My focus scripture is verse 7. The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I'm coming, another steps down before me. The title of this message is, I want you to say it out loud. Good job. Responsibility. Pray with me. Father, I thank you, Lord. I thank you for what you've already done. I thank you for what you're doing, Father. I pray, Lord God, that this word would be imparted into people's hearts and it would bring shift, Father. I pray that it would turn the lights on in the dark places of our hearts that we would be able to see, Father. I pray that there would be a strong level of courage in this place to say yes in hard times. I pray that this would be a wake-up call, Father. I pray that you would turn the volume up on uh, the dial so that we can hear the alarm as it sounds. Father, we thank you for what you're doing and what you're going to do in Jesus' name. And everybody shouted, amen. Response, ability. Some of you may say that's not how it's spelled, but it's on purpose, a play on words. Because in this season, we have to have the ability to respond. God needs you to respond in this season more than ever before. Now, the word responsibility the one word responsibility, it means this, the state or fact of being responsible, answerable, or accountable for something within one's power, control, or manage, management. Say, I'm responsible. In Matthew 25 and 23, it says this, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Now, this was a scripture that said, job well done, good and faithful servant, speaking to Christians who had stewarded their responsibilities. How many of you know that if you were saved, you have a responsibility? Now, watch this. How many of you know that if you're not saved, you still have the same responsibility? The responsibility does not change based on the condition of your heart. That's the key. We all have to give account to how we steward our responsibility, whether we're saved or unsaved. There is still a level of stewardship that we have to give to our responsibility. Romans 8 and 28 said this, and we know that all things work together for the, to those who love, to those who are the called according to his purpose. The word purpose means proposal. It means a plan especially a formal or a written one. Everyone in this room has a purpose or responsibility. If your heart is beating, you have a responsibility. You have a purpose. The question is, do you know what your purpose is? How many of you would not like to know a little bit more? What is my purpose? Let me raise your hand. There you go. How many of you would like to really know like the fullness of what your calling is and not only know it, but look, like, Lord, don't just show me my calling. Give me the courage to step into it because there is nothing more frustrating than knowing your calling but being afraid to step into it because how many of you know your calling will continue to mess with you as long as you live? It will mess with you. It knocking on your door all the time. Hey, what you doing? Hey, what you doing? Hey, why aren't you preaching? Hey, why aren't you teaching? Hey, why didn't you start your business? Hey, what are you doing? You're like, oh my goodness. You meet somebody in the store and they'll say something. It will remind you of your calling that you're running from. Because your calling is living. The the Lord is trying to trying to wake you up. It's an alarm. Every time you feel that nudge in you, I know that there's more on the inside of me. That's your calling kicking. 
where are those who have a calling burning in their heart? This has been a question I've been asking God for a long time. Where are the people who have a burning call in your heart? What is a burning call in your heart? A burning call in your heart means it really won't leave me alone and I can't sleep without it. I can't live without it. It's always on my mind. I am burdened about it. I want to talk about it. That's all I want to talk about. Why? Because that's why God put me on the earth because that is my assignment. And I believe that there is a remnant that have a burning heart. I'm not talking about church. I'm talking about a burning heart to fulfill the assignment of God where that's literally all you care about. I'm not here because it's exciting, y'all. Because it's not. Ministry is hard. How many of you know that? Ministry is not really something to be always excited about. You're expecting God to move. But it's a fight. Anybody know about that fight? And maybe it's not ministry that's hard for you. Maybe it's work that's hard for you. Your assignment is always going to bring resistance. You'll have exciting times, but if we can be realistic, I can be up here and lie and be like, man, it's so exciting all the time. You guys will be like, he lying. He lying. It's important for us to be real with one another. It's not always exciting. But just because it's not exciting don't mean it's not a calling. When you allow your calling to drive you, it doesn't matter if it's exciting or not. Paul said, all I know is when I get to Jerusalem, the only thing that I have to expect there is chains and persecution. But none of these things move me. Because you know why? You know why he was able to go toward his persecution and his chains and not be moved? Because he wasn't making decisions for himself. His calling was. When your heart burns, and your heart burns. Maybe you have a heart to see people saved. Maybe you have a heart to see people healed. Maybe you have a heart to see people come out of debt. Maybe you have a heart to see people delivered. Whatever it is that burns your heart will begin to make decisions for you. And it doesn't matter what anybody else does. It doesn't matter how hard it is. It doesn't matter if it's killing you. It doesn't matter if it's stressing you out. It's what wakes you up at night because it's the calling in your heart that burns. I want to know where, where are the people? Is there anybody in here? Even if there's just like five people in here, is there anybody in here who has a heart that burns? Or maybe you don't have a heart that burns for something. Maybe you want a heart that burns for something because you can feel a little flame, but you just don't know how to increase it. Let me tell you how to increase it. You get around other fires. You get around other fires because, see, fire needs oxygen. And maybe the people that are around you are suffocating you more than they're giving oxygen to you. Because when you have somebody in your life that is encouraging that small flame, they begin to stir something up on the inside of you. That's why Paul told Timothy, he says, stir the gift up that is on the inside of you. It literally means fan the flame. Why? Because the flame needs oxygen. That means that your flame needs to be in the right atmosphere that is conducive for growth because that little flame could turn into the wildfire if you get into the right place and there's some of you in here that have been walking around with little flame trying to figure out how to get bigger but you're only going to get that flame bigger when you get around the right oxygen the right people the right church the right climate it may not be this church it could be another church but you know that's the right atmosphere that is conducive for the oxygen to grow that flame on the inside of you where your heart begins to burn Colossians 3.23 said, whatever you do, work heartily as the Lord and not for men. Listen, if you're working for men, you'll burn out. And if you're working for men, you'll become addicted. Addicted to the wrong thing. You do the right, the right calling the wrong way. How many of you know you can do that? That's why you always have to be up here. And not right here. Everything that you do is unto the Lord. What, what would happen if we served each other like they were the Lord? I want you to think about that. So then the next question is, if we ask ourselves, if, what if we serve people like we serve the Lord? The question is, are we serving the Lord? Because serving the Lord is not just your prayer time in your prayer closet. Sometimes serving the Lord is, what have you done for someone? Who are you loving on? Who are you serving? 
to, to serve someone like they're the Lord. To, to be better at rolling the red carpet out for somebody. Because it's for the Lord. I'm going to treat you like I treat the Lord. So that really challenges us. How are we treating the Lord? You can tell how you're treating the Lord sometimes by how you treat people. What if we, I mean, just think about it. That's challenging for me. I'm like, man. How can I love the Lord better by loving people better? Amen? It's different. It makes you look at things differently. What you do unto these, you've done unto me. When I was sick, you didn't, when I was, when I was hungry, you didn't feed me. And I was without clothes, you didn't clothe me. Well, when did we ever see you hungry? When did we ever see you without clothes? What you do to the least of these, you've done unto me. Paul is killing Christians. Falls on the road to Damascus. And Jesus says, why do you persecute me? But when did I ever see you? I was, I was killing your people. What you do unto them, you've done unto me. You can serve the Lord better by serving people better. Maybe people will see the Lord more if we stop talking and start serving. I think I'm preaching about some future things. I think I'm preaching about some culture things. I think I'm preaching about some Kairos things. I think I'm preaching about some Tampa things. That we stop talking and start serving so that people can see the Lord. They will know you by your love. This is the key question here. This man who was laying at the pool of Bethesda amongst many sick people, feeble people, weak people, people who are trying to discover their calling, people who are trying to figure out what they were supposed to be doing in life, paralyzed people at the pool of Bethesda. It means a place of mercy. Well, here we are again talking about mercy. They're laying at a place of mercy. And the Bible said that Jesus walked up and the Bible said when he saw a certain man, didn't mention his name. He said he knew that he'd been there for a long time, 38 years. He approached the man and he said, do you want to be made well? Out of all those people, Jesus found that one person and said, do you want to be made well? This is the key here. The word do you want in the Greek, it means, is it in your mind to be made well? Is it your desire to be made well? Is it your determination? Are you determined to be made well? But when I hear that, it makes me question. Maybe it wasn't paralysis. Maybe it was a paradigm. He was there for 38 years. And the Lord said, is it in your mind to be made well? You would think the Lord would talk about his legs. You would think the Lord would talk about something else. And here the Lord is talking about his mind. He thought that the reason why he couldn't get to the water was because his legs weren't working. But now God is talking about his mind. Is it a paralysis problem or is it a paradigm problem? Maybe it wasn't his legs. Maybe it was his longing. Maybe it wasn't his movement. Maybe it was his mentality. Maybe it wasn't move, the move, lack of movement that kept him from the wa water. Maybe it was a lack of the mentality. So the question is, do you lack mentality? Do you lack determination? When's the last time you've been determined for something that didn't have to do with you? Because we've all been determined for something, but when have we been determined for something that didn't have to do with us? When have we been longing for something that wouldn't benefit us? Because we live in America in 2024 and we have this thing that we say, well, what's in it for me? Sometimes you cannot see the return on investment. But I'm not doing it for, so I can see the return on investment. I'm doing it because I love the Lord. I'm doing it because my calling. I'm doing it because something burns on the inside of me. I don't, you don't have to give me no money. You don't have to give me a gift. You don't have to tell me thank you. I'm doing it because my heart burns. When your heart burns, that's why you do it. And the Lord is here talking to him about his mind. He thought he had a feet problem. He, he thought he had a movement problem and found out he had a mentality problem. He thought he had a leg problem and found out it was really a longing problem. 
He thought it was paralysis, but really it was a paradigm. Maybe the reason why I can't get from here to there is because of what's going on in here. I've been here for 38 years and had no clue. The reason why I'm still here is because of what's here. Do you really want to be made well? Sometimes Jesus will ask you the question to find out what's in you. He already knows the answer to the question he's asking you, but he wants to know what's in you. Adam, where are you? It's not that I can't find you, but can you find you? It's not that I've lost you, but have you lost you? Adam, I'm asking you where you are because I want to know, do you know? Do you really want to be made well? It's important for us to understand as we begin to navigate John chapter 5 that there's two types of abil ability. As we talk about this, this title, response ability, it's important that we dissect what kind of abilities there are. And there's two types. There's an intellectual ability and then there's a physical ability. An intellectual ability is this. It's the cognitive potential for approaching different tasks. That's the intellectual the physical ability is narrowed to the physical strength one has to accomplish tasks requiring physical fitness. So intellectual ability is the cognitive potential, but physical ability is your natural strength and your natural potential. So here's the response that this man who's been laying on a bed for 38 years, I mean, if you really think about it, if I can paint the picture for you, you can imagine what's there around his bed. That was his life. That was his living room. That was his bedroom. That was his kitchen. That was his bathroom. That was his life on that bed. You can imagine how dirty that bed was. You can imagine what was around that bed. And you can imagine this man looked poverty and depressed. His countenance was probably down. He was probably dirty. He probably didn't smell too good. And Jesus saw this certain man, went to him and said, do you desire to be made well? And this man's response after 38 years of having a paradigm issue, he said this, sir, look, he, he, he was a mess, but he still had manners. Amen. <laughs> How many know you can be a mess and still have manners? You don't got to project your mess on everybody else, right? They can still be sir and ma'am. Amen. Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. I feel like I get close, and every time I get close, it just gets swept away from me. I feel like I'm starting to get to a place where I understand, and then all of a sudden, I don't understand anymore. I finally feel like I found my sweet spot, and then at the last minute, it just seems like it's gone. It seems like I just get right there, and then something else comes along the way to make me depressed again. God, when am I going to get out of this cycle? I've been here for 38 years, 15 years, 10 years, 2 years. I am tired. I've been here. I've made a house here. i made a living here. I have a bathroom here. I eat here. This is where I live. I live in the state of my mind. How do you live? How do you live? I'm thankful to have an amazing wife because she keeps the house clean all the time amen we got five kids so that's the whole job in itself but think about how you live because how you live sometimes can be what you feel I know sometimes if I ever feel like I'm getting in a slump, I'll just start cleaning it kind of helps me because psychologically I'm getting myself in order anybody ever been there before Sometimes when you get into your car and it's messy, you can get depressed. But then when you clean it, you're like, I feel I'm about business now, baby. Let's make some money. <laughs> right? Well, I, we, went, we, went, we went into a Porsche now. Like, if you start treating it like a thing, it don't matter how crusty your car is. How do you treat it? How do you treat it? You want a Porsche? Treat your Pinto like a Porsche. Treat it like a poor. Go and get you some, get you some cleaning stuff at AutoZone and just hook that thing up. It'll make you feel better. It'll make you feel better. 
Listen, y'all, sometimes, sometimes it's not really that deep. <laughs> sometimes it's not that deep. I tell people, they call me and they're like, man, I need some advice, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, clean your room. They're like, what? I thought you were, you were a pastor. You were supposed to pray for me. No, but a lot of the reasons your subconscious is actually stressed out. And you can't hear your subconscious. But you respond to something you can't hear. Your subconscious walked past your room and saw a mess and said to you, you're a mess. But you didn't hear it. But you felt it. But you don't know why you felt it. And so you're walking around depressed because you walked past your messy room. And then by the time the day goes on, you thought it was your boss. And it had nothing to do with your boss. It had everything to do with at 12 o'clock during your lunch break, you walked past your room and you knew you needed to do something and you didn't do it. And so now you're in a bad mood. It ain't that deep. You don't need to speak in tongues. You need to clean your room. Right? Like, sometimes it's just the simple things. And I'm typically, I can be kind of messy sometimes. I got a lot of stuff going on. I'll pick up one thing. Somebody will call me in the middle of it. I'll forget about it, do something else. And then I'm over here. And before you know it, I got books and papers and everything on my desk. And I'll be stressed out, not even know why I'm stressed out. And then I'll come home. My wife cleaned my whole desk for me. She didn't even speak in tongues for me, but I got delivered. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you, honey. You delivered me. Goodness gracious. He said, sir, I have nobody to put me into the pool. You need to tell your mind in this season no more excuses. You've been making too many excuses for yourself for too long. Sometimes God will withhold man from you so you can lean into him. I have nobody to put me into the pool. And every time I try, someone gets in before me. God will withhold the help of man so you don't have a choice but to lean on to him. So you're not actually rejected. He's just waiting until you lean on who accepted you. Sometimes the people who are rejecting you don't even know why they're rejecting you. It's actually the grace of God. Because if they didn't reject you, you would become codependent on that relationship. And God said, I need you to need me right now. So I can take you on to the next level. Jeremiah said this in 17 verse 5. This is what the Lord says. Cursed are those who put their trust in mere humans. Who rely on human strength and turn their hearts away from the Lord. They are like stunted shrubs in the desert with no hope for the future. They will live in the barren wilderness and in an inhabited salty land. That sounds horrible. Goodness. But the next verse says, those who trust in the Lord will be like a tree planted by the river. In this season, you got to trust the Lord more than you've ever trusted the Lord before. The question is, what does God trust you with? What does God trust you with? God has entrusted you with something that does not belong to you. And you're going to have to give an account to what he gave you. Isn't it amazing that God would give you something to borrow that's not even yours and say, hey, I'm gonna give this to you because you couldn't give this to you, but then I'm gonna give you the ability to multiply what's not yours. I mean, that's powerful. We got a God who's just like, I'm gonna give you this. And I wanna watch you multiply it because you multiplying it is a part of my nature. Somebody shout multiply. So I need you to hear me prophetically because I need you to learn how to catch the word. Some of your breakthrough was right there. I, 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 I want to stick here for a second because sometimes, sometimes we can get so stuck in the message that we forget that the message is trying to do something in us right now. Like there is so much declaration that the word is bringing forth that is actually granting you permission in the moment. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Like, like so, so you got to learn how to catch the word, not like good information, but catch the word like now, now permission. Like multiply. When I said multiply, I said, hold on a second, Lord. I feel you. He said that he gave you something that isn't yours. He gave it to you because you couldn't give it to you. And then he gave you the ability to multiply it. 
what do you have? He gave you two, why do you still have two? When he gave you the power to multiply it. The reason why I say you have to learn to catch that is because permission has been granted in the atmosphere. That's your deliverance. Stop asking questions and multiply. What do you have? You can multiply it. Make sense? Somebody say, I'm going to multiply. To whom much is given, much is required. There's a great responsibility with it. There are great things that are in store for you, but you have to steward what God has given you. How are you going to respond in this season? Think about how you responded in the last season. Maybe the last season was like, Lord, I don't know about that. Maybe in the last season was like, man, that's too hard for me. Maybe in the last season, I was like, man, I, I, I just don't know. I just, have you really called me to this? Is this really what you're saying? In this season, you are going to have to respond differently. You're going to have to have a new ability to respond. Jesus ignored the excuse. He did not have a conversation with the answer. How many of you know Jesus don't care about some of the things y'all got to say? You, you, you ain't, you ain't, why does my water keep falling? I'm about to throw it. How many of you know that sometimes the Lord doesn't care about our pity parties? Well, you know, he might have been crying and I, I just don't have anything to do. And, and a lot of us, as, uh, sometimes leaders would think this is a counseling moment. This is not a counseling moment. I don't care why you don't want to get in the water i don't care why you can't get in the water i don't care what your excuse is that's not why i asked you the question i'm ignoring the thing that you've been dwelling on and i'm getting to the point point. and you know some people don't like pastors that get to the point because they like to stay there so getting to the point is too harsh because you're not being empathetic it's not that i'm not being empathetic it's that, that that's not the real problem he ignored the excuse and Jesus said to him, rise and take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. That word rise, it means to waken. And God told me that he is sounding the alarm to all of the sleepwalkers in Tampa. The sleepwalkers in America. He said, rise up, take up your bed and walk. He is calling forth the sleepwalkers. It's the sleepwalkers who are, who are awake, but they're sleeping and they're walking around. Incoherent, not there. I'm here, but I'm not here. God is sounding the alarm to the sleepwalkers in this generation. Some of you have been going in and out of church, but you've been asleep. Some of you are really asleep now. Like literally. I know I get it Saturday night. But God, see, that was a little alarm. That was see, like how I threw that in there right there. Somebody woke up and said, Hallelujah. God is calling forth to sleepwalkers in this generation. We were talking about rise up. Jasmine had no clue what I was preaching today. Declaring of, of warriors and declaring of army, and there's an army rising up. This is the question. When you have a burning heart, you believe that. Like, I'm not here. When I'm over there, I'm not just here to worship with the worship crew. I'm here believing prophetically. I'm catching the language of someone who is prophetically singing and declaring something over Tampa about the season that we're currently in. That's how you catch the word beyond just the sound of worship. It's when you realize that God is speaking through the woman of God about the season that we're in. And then she begins to declare, we're about to cross over. We're about to cross over. I'm catching that word and believing that we're crossing over now because it happened in the atmosphere you've got to learn how to catch the kairos moment when the kairos moment happens and stop just looking at it like a moment that moment can turn into momentum when you catch it and some of us we come to service and we catch the word but on our way out we put it in the bucket it can turn into momentum if you can multiply it I believe that word. I'm going to multiply it. You gave it to me. I couldn't give it to myself. I'm going to multiply it because you gave me the ability. And all you need is for me to respond. That's all you need is a response. Here I am, Lord. 
We were singing earlier about, I give my heart. My heart belongs to you. We have to ask ourselves, are we just saying it? Or do we really believe that our heart belongs to him? Because if it did, our hearts would burn differently. If it did, we would see souls a whole lot differently when we're at the store. We'll see people who need Jesus. And if they died today, they would go straight to hell. Because really, who's talking about Jesus anymore, really? It's starting to put a burning desire in my heart. A burning desire in my heart. Literally, I see eventually there's going to be a time where there's going to be teams of people that are going to hit the streets and there's going to be miracles that are going to take place. I want to know where are those army at? Where's the army at? Where are the people whose hearts are burning? Now listen, don't get excited about the group of people hitting the streets if you don't got it in you now. Just you. Because see, we get excited about the gathering. We get excited about the pastor putting something together. But I've learned in leadership never to take suggestions always because sometimes the people who suggest things will be the ones that won't show up. Am I talking right? Hey, we should do this, we should do that, and we do it, and they gone. So that's why I say this. Don't get excited about everybody hitting the street if you're not burning by yourself. You've got to burn by yourself because when each of you burn by yourself, then when we get together, there will be a real fire. There's going to be a real fire. There's going to be a real burning and a real hunger for the things of God. He said, wake up, rise up and take up your bed and walk. And that day was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said to him, who was, who was cured? It is a Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. This is what the Lord told me. He said, I want you to talk to them real quick about the bed. The bed is the representation of a manifested testimony. It is the fruit of what happened. He could have easily just said, get up and walk. But why would he take that nasty bed with him? I want you to carry the mess. See, this is what y'all don't understand, y'all. I don't, I don't have a lot of notes. I really let the Lord lead. Do you know what's happening right now? The Lord is orchestrating the entire service with the message. Things I didn't have planned on saying, God is making it make sense based on what happened in worship. All I have on here, literally all I have is the bed, the manifest testimony, the fruit of what happened. While I'm standing over here, God said, tell them they got to carry their mess. What did we talk about during worship? Being okay with the mess because you got to carry it. You got to learn how to carry it. Don't own it, carry it. Don't own it, carry it. The Lord told me to tell you, stop hiding your bed. It's time to be proud of what he brought you out of. It's time to be proud of what he brought you out of. God is going to begin to start magnifying testimonies in this season because some of you are going to have to be honest and really admit what you went through. Some of you are still hiding your bed. You've been laying there. You've been abused. You've been molested. You've been hurt, you've been beat, you've been rejected, you've been ostracized, you've been abandoned, you've been mistreated. But you're still hiding in your bed because you don't want nobody to know. And if we can be honest with, with ourselves, we don't want to know. So you haven't seen your bed since it happened to you because I don't want to open that door. But God said, I don't want you to just get up though. I want you to take your mess with you. Why? Because your mess isn't for you. Your mess is for them. And I want you to carry your mess with you so that the religious folks can get mad. And they can say, what's she doing? Why are you carrying this messy stuff? He said, I don't know. There was a man back there. And he told me, I love it. He said, there was a man back there. I don't even know his name. But there was a man. How many of you know, it don't matter who he is. As long as they can get you out of a situation that you've been in for 38 years. He said, I don't need to know his name. I just listened to him because I knew that there was something on his life. That's why I called him sir. I knew there was something about the question that he asked me. I didn't fully understand it. But I knew that something was about to happen. And when he told me to rise up and 
take up my bed. I didn't even know that I've been a sleepwalker my whole life. But something happened on the inside of me that woke me up and made me do something I never thought that I can do. I don't know what it was about his words, but I've heard many people talk. But when this man showed up and he found me in my mess, he told me, rise up and walk. And other people have said similar things, but they didn't carry the weight that this man carried. I don't know his name, but I know he carried some power. I know he carried ability. I know he carried a strength that was not my own. And that's why I'm walking this day. Who told you to carry your bed? I'm carrying my mess because I met a man and I don't need to know his name. But there was power that came to my legs. Power that came to my mind. Power that came to my ability. And now I'm walking in the very thing he called me to walk in. God said that he is going to magnify your testimony. Some of you have not told your testimony in a while because you're not carrying your bed. You're carrying your shame. And God said your shame belongs on the cross. Your guilt belongs on the cross. Your embarrassment belongs on the cross. Your victim mentality belongs on the cross. Now I need you to lay down the thing that's keeping you from my glory. And I need you to pick Pick up the mess, pick up the abuse, pick up what they did to you, pick up the bed, and I need you to walk because what happened to you was not for you, it was for them. Shout, it was for them. Jesus. Take up your bed and walk. And they asked him, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed did not know who he was, for Jesus had withdrawn because of multitude being in that place. Jesus did the work and he left. God is about to do a quick work. You won't even know where it came from. A quick work. Kairos won't get the credit for it. A quick work, Sheldon won't get the credit for it. A quick work, prayer won't get the credit for it. A quick work, a tongue won't get the credit for it. Because some of us have been trying to work our mess off. A quick work is what he's going to do because he is a God of mercy. So here this man is carrying his bed. And Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see... See, I love it. I, I'm just getting this revelation right now, y'all. Listen, this man was on the bed for 38 years. Pick up your bed and walk. He begins to start getting criticized by the religious folks in the area. And Jesus went to go look for him. And found the man who ain't been in the temple for 38 years in the temple. Where will you take your bed? Where will you take your testimony? Where will you take what he did for you? Sometimes God wants to know if he does a miracle in your life, are you going to be de more devoted to him? Is the miracle that he does in you going to make you long for him more? Is the miracle that he does for you going to make you desperate for him more? Is the miracle that he does for you going to make you more committed? Or is it going to give you a freedom to just do what you want? I got healed at the church, but I ain't been to church in three months. No, this man, after 38 years of being down, was healed by Jesus Christ and went straight into the temple and Jesus found him. And watch what he said. He said, sin no more. Let's a worse thing come upon you. Who would have ever known that it was sin that got him there? It, it wasn't a paralysis. It was a, it was a mindset. It was a sin problem. It was sin that got him there. He said, hey, don't sin anymore. Let something worse come upon you. Because an infirmity, was an, you invited an infirmity. And that's what puts you down. I love it because Jesus didn't say, hey, I need you to bow down to me and say this, this, and that if you want to get free. No, he said, hey, hey, listen, sin no more. You know what that means? That wasn't a law that he was giving him because he knew the man wouldn't be perfect. It was permission. It, when you tell somebody that, that has a struggle, they don't have to anymore. That's called permission. Permission was granted to this man. Hey, sin got you there but you don't have to do it anymore. Come on, say to yourself, I don't have to do it anymore. 
How many of you got problems? <laughs> Say, I don't have to do them anymore. He said, sin no more, lest something worse come upon you. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who made him well. The first time he talked to the Jews, he didn't know who it was. The second time he talked to the Jews, he said, it was Jesus. God is about to give you a, it was Jesus. He's about to do it immediately in your life where you're going to say it was Jesus. Maybe you didn't have language for what he did for you before while you're carrying around your mess. But this time you're going to say, I know exactly who it was who did this for me. I know exactly who it was who set me free. I know exactly who it was why because this man that was in the bed he responded and God wants to know is there a call on the inside of you that you're willing to respond to because Paul said I press toward the goal the upward call of God each and every one of you have a call of God in Ephesians 4 he said therefore I am a prisoner of for serving the Lord I beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. A prisoner for serving the Lord. He was a slave to his calling. People won't understand it. Why you always want to do it. People don't understand it. Listen, people didn't question you about your addiction to other things. They help you with it. They're like, oh, you addicted me too. Now we can talk. But what Paul was saying is that I'm not addicted to the law anymore. I'm addicted to my calling. I'm a slave to my calling, the upward call of God, because I'm serving God with everything in me. Why? Because my heart burns. The Bible said that he saw the man at the pool of Bethesda, and that word saw, it means to see, to visit, and to interview. And God wanted me to tell you before we leave here tonight that he sees you. And not only does he see you, but he wants to visit you. I believe, and you can believe it too, that you're about to walk into a season of great visitation. But you have to posture yourself for it. You have to carry this word, what I'm about to say, and believe it. So that when you're in the car and you can hear me say this as the Lord is saying it to you now, there is visitation coming in this season. That means, and I'm not talking about visitation when you want it. I'm talking about posture yourself always in it. Leaving the door open for God to show up in your car, in your room, in the bathroom, wherever you are, there's visitations coming. He sees you, he's going to visit you. Now watch this, and then he's going to interview you. How you respond in this season. Wake up. Wake up. Now is the time to wake up. The Lord is coming. Jesus is coming. And when he takes account, we want him to be proud. Job well done, good and faithful servant. You were responsible with what wasn't yours. You multiplied what wasn't yours. You weren't afraid of what wasn't yours. You weren't afraid of yourself. I know now that you feared the Lord because you walked in what I put in you. We got to get over ourselves, stop serving ourselves, and start serving God. We can't serve fear better than we serve God. We can't serve doubt better than we serve God. We can't serve insecurity better than we serve God. We can't keep serving the thing that keeps us on our bed any longer. I see a room full of hungry people. Some of you haven't been hungry in a while like you know how to be hungry. And the Lord said, that's okay. That's okay. I'm not condemning you. I'm rising you up. I'm not telling you that you're wrong because you haven't been hungry, but what I'm telling you is I'm rising you up. I'm rising you up. But I don't have anybody, Lord, but I don't have this, Lord, but I don't have that. But the Lord said, but what do you have? Because sometimes what we have is standing right in front of us. 
Ain't it crazy how we can be looking at Jesus, telling Jesus what we don't have, not realizing that everything we need is in the person who asks us the question. <laughs> He's here. He's here. If you find yourself on that bed, I want you to come up real quick. If you know you need to wake up, I need you to come here real quick. If you know that there's a calling on the inside of you that you know needs stirred, I want you to come up real quick. If you know that now is the time, I need you to come up real quick. If you know that you need to rise up, I need you to come here real quick. Because there's something strong on the inside of you that God wants to wake up. The enemy was trying to hit snooze on the alarm clock, but the button don't work no more. The button don't work no more. Come on, if you come forward, I want you to lift up your hands and step forward. Come closer so I know who's who. begin to start praying see the waters were stirred but that's not how it was gonna happen he thought it was gonna happen like this when the water is stirred then I'm gonna step into it when this opportunity comes, I'm going to step into it. And the opportunity doesn't come. And this opportunity comes, I'm going to step into it. And then that opportunity doesn't come. And then this thing happens. And I, okay, this is how I'm going to do it. Because this man who was in the bed, that was his plan. And his plan never worked how he thought it was going to work. And he lay there frustrated. And Jesus came up and said, it wasn't the plan, nor was it the man. It wasn't the plan, nor was it the man that was going to do it. It was Jesus. It is Jesus. Jesus lives. <laughs> man, goodness. Jesus lives. What does that mean anymore? Jesus lives and the devil has been trying to make a lie out of him he lives and the reason why that is important for us to know is because if he didn't live there would be no point in us being up here have any ushers in the house this is a good time to be ready that means follow me parallel me come on I want you to pray for a moment I want you to open your mouth and begin to pray because Jesus is in the room right now he sees you and now he's about to visit you you need Jesus to visit you. You need an encounter with God. You thought it was going to be one way, and now here we are. It's happening a whole nother way. Your answer is coming a whole nother way in Him. Come on, tap in just a little bit more. I want it to be about Him. I want it to be about Him. I want it to be about Him. I, want, I, I don't want you to beg right now. I want you to say thank you. <laughs> I want you to lift up your bed before Him and make a declaration I'm lifting up my bed before you because see he already visited you while I was preaching now it's time for you to demonstrate what the word said the word had already come forth now you've got to lift up your bed and you've got to declare because the mess that you went through wasn't for you be made well and lift up your bed it was Jesus 
It wasn't Kairos. It was Jesus. It wasn't Sheldon. It was Jesus. It wasn't a book. It was Jesus. It wasn't a devotion. It was Jesus because he still lived. A reaping season. All the seeds and prayers. <laughs> oh, the intercessor. The intercessor. Wake up, the intercessor. All of the words and prayers. The silent prayers and the loud prayers. <laughs> reap, daughter. Reap, daughter, old prayers. Like Zacharias, your prayer has been heard. <laughs> your prayer has been heard. Your prayer has been heard. Come on, there's a travailing in the room. There's a travailing in the room. There's a there's a travailing in the room. There's a birthing in the room. Yeah, everything changes 
do know you are here you are Provider, my God. 